Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we have the distinct and rare privilege of hearing a great contemporary Catholic educator, Dr. David Whalen, speak on one of the most influential Catholic educators in recent memory, the ever-challenging and engaging John Sr. As we can see by the, the enthusiasm and the size of the crowd here tonight, the state and future of Christian culture, the transmission of which we call education, is a topic of great moment to communities like this one. As a professor at Hillsdale College for the past 20 years, Dr. Whalen has devoted much thought and labor to how students are awakened to wonder by an experience of the true, the good, and the beautiful. As the college's provost, he's had cause to reflect upon the cumulative effect of these individual experiences on the culture of a campus, and in turn on the families, churches, and local communities which those students become a part of as adults. At Hillsdale now, and previously at Belmont Abbey College in the University of Kansas, Dr. Whalen has taught Victorian and modern British literature and great books. He also teaches upper-level courses on the liberal arts, New York poetry, and the writings of Blessed John Henry Newman. Now it gives me special pleasure to introduce Dr. Whalen uh, because of the particular role he's played in my own spiritual and intellectual development. I first met Dr. Whalen uh, a decade ago when as a high school senior, I attended a short summer study abroad trip with a number of other prospective Hillsdale College students. Uh, at the time my father signed me up for this trip, largely against my will, I intended to enroll at a state school and double major in biology and chemistry. However, this particular course was devoted to studying a handful of Shakespeare's plays while exploring the Bard's native England. Dr. Whalen was one of four professors brave enough to lead this rabble. After two weeks of discussing poetry, trying the black pudding, talking late into the night, and attending my first mass, the example of Dr. Whalen's intellect and joy persuaded me that Hillsdale College might just have something to offer. Now, having once allowed the melancholy Dane and admired Miranda into my imagination, it wasn't long until I left off pursuing biology and chemistry and decided to double major instead in English and classics. Now, just as Dr. Whalen played a role in uh, introducing me to Shakespeare, so too he brought about uh, my introduction to Catholicism, largely through the works of Blessed John Henry Newman. Every college student and every convert has the great joy of feeling as though they're the first traveler on the road to Damascus or Emmaus, as the case may be, but of course my experience is an unusual one. In fact, those of you who know of John Sr., whose work Dr. Whalen is here to discuss tonight, are likely familiar with the similar trajectory experienced by some 200 or more students involved in the Integrated Humanities program at the University of Kansas, where Dr. Whalen himself completed his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Like John Sr. before him, Dr. Whalen is an educator who realizes that learning begins in wonder and ends in wisdom, that we begin by awakening deep and abiding loves in children, and by starting them on the path of rightly ordering those loves. So once again, let me say what a great privilege it is to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. David Whelan. Well, see, now that's just no good at all. I was going to tease him by saying every, every good thing he said about me was a lie. And then he became autobiographical and started giving me credit for things of personal import, which is probably the part that's a lie, but you can't say that. To say. Um, thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. I am um, going to deposit some of these materials on the floor so I can trip over them later. If I reach for that little book that I just dropped, you know things are getting desperate because that's a book of poetry by uh, a colleague, Dr. Seniors, and there are some marvelous poems in there. And, and as Zach might, uh, and others here might tell you, uh, if I start reading a lot of poetry, that means I'm tired of hearing myself speak and I'd rather, I'd rather uh, listen to the poets. As I say, it is indeed a, a pleasure and an honor to be here, especially because um, an invitation to speak about John Sr., the man and, and John Sr.'s thought, is a rare privilege to pay in that manner in which one does pay a debt that is ultimately unpayable. It is an opportunity, an occasion to 
pay a debt of gratitude uh, to John Sr. He is probably the single most influential, other than my parents, he's probably the single most important and influential uh, person I've encountered in my 53, nearly 54 years now. It's, he's impossible to describe. Um, he was not some crazy mystic character that would impress everyone just by walking into a room. <laughs> he was much deeper than that. It was much more profound than some sort of pseudo-spirituality a la Hollywood. Um, but his greatness became quickly apparent and grew in one's apprehension the more one knew him. So, to talk about John Sr., to talk about his thought, is, as I say, an occasion of gratitude. Um, the, uh, the thing, perhaps, in, in a certain respect, Zach's introduction touched on the key points, uh, or some of the key points, uh, thank you, of, of my, uh, my talk tonight. Uh, when, I, when I arrived, when I saw how many people were here, I was really quite taken aback. I mean, John Sr. died in, what, was it 1999, and he lived a long way away. Don't think he spent any time in Michigan if he was ever here. Uh, what would, what would an, a, a parish uh, buried in Grand Rapids, what interest could there be in John Sr.? Um, I certainly knew it wasn't interested in me, but then I saw the wine and beer, and oh, okay, now I understand. <laughs> And it is one week after Easter, so, so that, that, that will draw the crowd. <laughs> um, uh, but Zach's introduction did touch on uh, some, some key points, particularly uh, the, the heart of Senior's thought. I, I, I actually hesitate to say very quickly or readily what I think the heart of his thought was, because it, 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 to do so, I, I often tell students, if you can put something in a nutshell that belongs there, um, uh, it, it to, 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 to give somebody a formula is the opposite of teaching, right? To give them a formula gives them a means of not learning a thing. Uh, they don't have to learn it because they have a formula. They, 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 they don't really digest it. They don't understand it. They don't, what's the cliche today? Don't, they don't internalize it. But they think they know something because they can reproduce the formula. So, so I sort of hesitate to, to put the engine or the, the driving force of his thought in propositional form. But if I had to do so, you see, I preface the very thing I say I don't want to do, now I'm going to do it. Uh, I, I, I would say that it is a, a very a curious, a fascinating form of love. Overused word, I'm sorry, I know we're all sick of hearing about love, perhaps, but, but John Sr. loved this may sound paradoxical, maybe a little unorthodox, but he loved the world. He loved it passionately and profoundly and deeply. He was a great teacher, but in his heart of hearts, he was a kind of poetic philosopher, or maybe a philosophical poet. Maybe that's the proper order. And you can't be that without looking at things around you and outside of you, and in some sense being drawn out of yourself being drawn toward that something, being, Zach mentioned, wonder, uh, being, being uh, elevated in a, a state or condition of wonder by the very being of that thing, and then calling the attention to, of others to that being. That's what poets do. And that's very much what Senior did his entire life, drew the attention of others, whether in his few poems or much more commonly, of course, in his classes, in his conversations, drew the attention of others to the real, the real thing, whatever that thing is. You might, some of you might know Ch G.K. Chesterton has a, a little book called The Thing. And I, I mean the thing in that Chestertonian sense. That is a fundamental deposit of reality. Senior would, would draw others' attention to that in, in the fashion and the work of, of a kind of poet. So, so he was deeply in love with the world, but knew very well that the world, uh, the fall has done wonderful things, right? The world can only be properly loved. And by properly, I don't mean just morally rightly. I mean that it can only be loved in efficaciously 
If God is loved first, nothing, nothing fails like at, at being worldly, like worldliness. And that's the paradox. Nothing fails in being worldly like worldliness. If you're a, a, a kind of Catholic worldliness can embrace with passionate, almost devote, devout love the world precisely because God is loved, not just more in some sort of quantitative way, but, but the author of the world is loved primarily and the world is loved as his handiwork. Now, again, just to put that in a nutshell, sounds like a nice piety, perhaps, um, although maybe a disconcerting one at first, to talk about loving the world and worldliness, but, but it is true um, uh, of John Sr. He, he was a profoundly reflective and, and thoughtful man, profoundly perceptive. The articulation that you detect in his works when you read him You've heard this before, perhaps, and I apologize to repeat it, but, but it was nothing compared to his Viva Voce conversation. Uh, these books, his books are terrific, um, but those of us who, who, for some mysterious reason, know him and, and only to the mind of God, were blessed to have him as a professor, uh, know that, that the, these books, great as they are, serve best to us as reminders of the, the, the deeper greatness in his conversation. So, um, uh, enough of introductory matter. Let me, let me begin, or rather, let me conclude my introduction to, uh, to this address by reading one of his poems entitled Contempt is Mine. I'm an English professor, so I do this. I, will, I have a captive audience. I was at a faculty meeting this morning, and I came this close to reading a poem to the entire faculty. And that's, that's how cruel I can be. Just ask my former students here. Contemptus Mundi. These poems are touched with a kind of wit and twinkle in the eye. How great the joys of heaven are that need no April to recover, or surprise, no lilac nor the pumpkins of October. There they need no sun and rainbows of emerald. Why must we burn in heart and brain by flaming fickleness enthralled? Two ways to make contemptible the world. The first is not to look. The second, and more sensible, to read it like a book. To learn the grammar and the word, loving not the less but more, contemning it as music heard supersedes the score. Now, I won't teach the poem, I promise. And I won't even reread the whole thing, but I will reread the last two stanzas, the last two quatrains. Two ways to make, remember what I said about loving the world and loving God, two ways to make contemptible the world. Remember the title of the poem is Contemptus Mundi, Contempt of the World, a, a highly praised attribute of the spiritually rich. Two ways to make contemptible the world. The first is not to look. The second, and more sensible, now he's punning when he says sensible, he's including the senses, right? The physical senses. The second, and more sensible, to read it like a book. Um, many of you no doubt are hearing that great patristic and medieval uh, comparison of the world to the Bible. Uh, God is said, you, you recall, to be the author of two books, the book of the world and the book of the Bible. And it, is our, it is our task to read both books. Then the second and more sensible to read it like a book to learn the grammar and the word, loving not less, but more, contemning it, that is the, the world, contemning it as music heard supersedes the score. So you see how that works. The music heard is the creator of the world. When you, when you, when you hear Beethoven, you have contempt for the score. 
not for the composition, but but you put down the page. I mean, who? I, I know musicians have to. They're they're professionally obligated to pay attention to the score as they listen. But you have to you have to admit that's fairly inhuman, right? Uh, uh, something superhuman, subhuman. I don't know, but it isn't human to to hear something glorious like Beethoven or Mozart while studying the score. Put the ballet thing down and listen, right? That's that's contempt of the score, right? You, of course, love the score, but you love the music much more. The score is your avenue to the music, right? So to the world, love the world. Senior very much loved the world and loved the author as the music of it, as it were. Um, okay, I, I do, by the way, that's the end of my introductory remarks. Um, after this, what, whatever little excitement you, you had in that introduction is dead and gone. Now it's time to take a, take a nap. I'm glad you're fortified with wine. Um, um, the, the, uh, I, do, I, I will keep some kind of an eye on time, and I do plan to keep a, a pretty healthy period available for questions and answers. I understand that there are lots of people here who have different kinds of interest in John Singer. And as I tell my students all the time, ask me anything you wish, what I don't know, I'll simply invent. Okay. So, so the, the, the other perhaps surprising thing to say is, um, in, in John Senior's estimation, you know, this book that I was asked to address, The Restoration of Christian Culture, it, it succeeds another book, a different book, The Death of Christian Culture. Given that, perhaps this statement is unnecessary, but we perhaps should begin by uh, uh, saying that in his, John Senior's estimation, uh, and I, I don't mean this to sound apocalyptic or alarmist or, you know, head for the hills. Uh, but pretty much, he thought Western civilization was over. This is maybe the, to continue the musical metaphor. This is we're in the coda, at best. Um, we're in some post something. We, scholars like to talk about the postmodern. Actually, now they even talk about the post postmodern. I, they, all, all we can do is just add some more posts. It's like a fence post. Just put in another post. You know, post postmodern. We, we have the abiding sense that we're after something, not the sense that we're before anything. Okay, that's the condition of the modern imagination. At least it, it was John Singer's conviction that that Christian culture was pretty much over. It was dead. I think if you look at the newspaper, cheap example I know. But if you look at the newspaper, you get some kind of confirmation of that. So, so a recovery of Christian culture, Senior really thought was impossible. Maybe not even desirable, a recovery. But a restoration was essential. Okay, there's a dis distinction. A recovery is a, is a pulling back the thing that was. A restoration is a kind of new creation. Analogous to or an extension of the thing that was. Um, um, think about the you know recovering a boat or restoring a boat. Two very different actions. So his restoration of Christian culture was very much written with this conviction in the background. It is a book of paradoxes, not the not the flashy Chestertonian paradoxes that make you giggle. Although some seem very humorous. I remember as a student thinking, God, this guy. And, and you wouldn't think it, um, uh, but I remember thinking this guy could be a stand-up comic. He, uh, not, not that that's terribly important, but his, his sense of humor was so sharp. And his, he, I'm sorry, those of you who are in theater will get what I'm pointing at. Even his timing was perfect. You know, the, the drum beat, da bum uh, he, he was a remarkably funny man. So there are times when, when you might laugh when reading him. But, but no, his paradoxes are a kind of quiet, uh, are, are a, a sort of quiet reflection on paradoxes that are buried in the, in the uh, architecture, you might say, in the design of the world. Uh, they, they tend to be hidden. Um, for instance, as I intimated earlier, it concerns, his book concerns the right order of this world, but for the sake of the next one. So it, it can sometimes be dizzying to readers, uh, uh, the restoration of uh, Christian culture, because one minute they're talking in the most vague, one minute they're reading words of the most ecstatic, rapturous sort about the glories of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the very next paragraph, they're talking about, uh, they're reading about men 
going to pubs to drink because they're happy and not to get happy. And, you know, how, did, how did we get from here? And yet it seemed effortless and seamless while you were reading it. It's only when you put it down that you realize, and, and, and your spouse or somebody asks, so what were you reading about? And then you begin to splutter like a fool. Oh, the Blessed Virgin, the Mystical Rose and Pubs, and Fireplaces, and Dante, and this curious Renaissance fashion of uh, opposite mimicking. And the Blessed Virgin. <laughs> so, <clears throat> as I say, it can be, it can be hard to follow. Um, the book argues that, another paradox, that the active life of this world, the life, you know, the, the, the worldly life, the active life, is invigorated only, at least after Christ, is invigorated only when the retired life, the contemplative life, the retired life of prayer prospers. You don't get to be worldly without contemplatives. I think that's, you ought to laugh at that, just out of courtesy. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, to, it sounds like a pious point until you think about what it means, right? And then you realize it's rather radical. We only get to be proper. The, you only get to really enjoy your beer if there are enough monks around who are serious about doing it. Ah, there. Now that's a little giggle. Um, uh, the, uh, another paradox. Um, he he argues that. The way for us to advance, the way toward a restoration of Christian culture, is to restore a life of apparent retrogression. That is a retreat from technological progress and innovation. We live in a world that is enthralled with technological progress, that looks at the, the newest gimmick. I mean, aren't you all waiting with bated breath um, uh, for the very next iPhone? And what will it be able to do? It will be able to you know, read your heartbeat and transmit it to somebody in Beijing uh, effortlessly, without you even wanting it to. Oh, joy. Um, so so if, you, if, senior, if he had lived long enough to see the technological developments of the last thing, I think he would die again of laughter, uh, the, the ridiculousness of some. But, but he thought that we actually, as a civilization, need to progress, to advance to the restoration of Christian culture by regressing from technology. More about that in a, in a minute. Um, um, John Sr., uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of bio, very brief, and then, and then I'll tell you about my introduction to him. Personally, uh, he was uh, a native of Long Island, he was raised on Long Island, and uh, as a young man bugged his father so much about wanting to be a cowboy, he was given uh, a, a, enough money for a horse and a one-way ticket to Wyoming and kicked out. Uh, I'm not making that up. Um, he, so he, as a, I think a middle teenager, he went out to Wyoming and uh, learned to ride horses and to herd cattle. Uh, he, he told the story, um, he, this is the poet, right? This is senior, the poet. He told the story about sitting at a rodeo once against, uh, and sitting next to some old geezer of a cowboy. Uh, and, and he saw this guy come out, this cowboy, uh, breaking a horse, you know, uh, riding a bronco, and he was good, he was really good. And senior said, uh, I, I turned to the cowboy next to me and said, wow, he's so good, he looks like he's part of the horse. See, now I'd be proud of myself if I said that. That's kind of a poetic way of expressing that. You know, he's so good, he looks like he's part of the horse. That's impressive. This, this old cowboy said, watch the next guy, he's better. He makes the horse look like it's part of him. <laughs> so, so, and senior, the, the reason he told that story isn't just because it's a neat story, it's actually true about craft and art and the making of things. Uh, 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 this is that, that poetic observation of John Senior's, right? The, the artist, the poet, the, 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 the craftsman, see, doesn't, doesn't as it were, um, he, he, well, think of the piano. Think of it like a piano. You, the, the, the craftsman, learning the craft of, of being a pianist, subjects himself to the order of the piano, right? You become the piano's slave. And if you've ever... Musicians here know exactly what I mean. You become the slave of the instrument. But, but, once you're good enough, what happens is the instrument becomes part of you. Those rules are reversed. You know, this instrument is subsumed to your 
commanding performance, right? Uh, so you have to subject yourself to it in order to subject it to yourself. And that's, what, that, that's a profound observation about the nature of excellence in craft, whether we're talking about plumbing or concert piano playing or poetry writing or poetry reading for that matter or teaching. Um, that, 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 that was something that, again, you could tell Senior picked up, was picking up um, these insights all the time. And anyway, he, uh, um, later he went to Columbia and studied with Mark Van Doren, a very famous poet, American poet and professor who taught in the Columbia Great Books program, funded by John Gerskine a generation earlier. Um, uh, after that, he taught at a few colleges back east, moved back to Wyoming, taught there for a little bit. There are some very early, there are some early uh, cassettes and recordings of senior giving lectures about John, blessed John Henry Newman, to uh, seminarians in Wyoming in, I think, 1963 or something. Those are pure gold. Um, uh, he then moved to the University of Kansas and with Dennis Quinn and Frank Nellick, two other professors, started the human, uh, Integrated Humanities program, uh, which became famous, or I should say infamous, for the number of its converts. Um, uh, there was a, uh, the Kansas City Star, the daily paper in Kansas City, had a front page story, I kid you not, I've got a copy of this at home, a front page story. And, and you know how modest uh, stayed old-fashioned newspapers are. They don't like big headlines and they don't like splashy graphics. They didn't used to. Now they're all competing with U.S. Um, what's that paper? USA, Today. USA Today. Right. They're all competing with Flash, so everybody's being flashy. But anyway, this paper, this was in the old-fashioned stayed conservative days of the front page, but nevertheless, they had a three-inch tall graphic going from left to right across the entire page. On the left was a, the drawing of a hippie you know, the bell bottoms and long hair and the patches, the holes and the patches and the clothes, you know, probably a joint and something. And, and, and there was this evolutionary progression of gradual change until over on the right was a monk. <laughs> so this hippie gradually turned into a Benedictine monk and, uh, you know, pretty good for the Kansas City Star. And that, that was because that issue had a big long story about the Integrated Humanities Program and these wild, crazy, irresponsible professors who were turning everything that stood still into a Catholic. Um, <laughs> stones, you know, uh, pillars, uh, four tiles, whatever. Um, well, the, the, I was completely unaware of all of this. I went to the University of Kansas for dull and unimaginative reasons. It was in the backyard, as where I grew up in Kansas City. And, but I had heard of this great books program, and I, I had seen the list of books that were taught in this program, and they were all the books that everyone ought to have read. And I had read a few of them, but not very many. And I was nerdy and bookish enough to think, ooh, I should do that. I should read all of those. That's, that would be cool. Uh, I had not heard of any controversy. I had not heard of John Sr. I had not heard of anything. I just saw a book list. Well, I went, I, uh, uh, went to the university freshman year, the, the week before classes begin, they have what they call orientation, and I, I learned my first great lesson. I was a protected suburban kid, right? I learned my first great lesson in bureaucracy. I kid you not, I, re I remember one instance in particular, I stood in a line for four hours. You know, I'm a docile, sort of obedient suburban kid. I, I, I should have burned the place down, but, you know, stood in line for four hours only to be told when I got to the front of it, oh, no, 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 you don't have to drop and add this. It was done automatically when you turned in this or that test score. <laughs> so I went to my classes. The last first class that I went to was the Integrated Humanities, and I had a class in psychology. I had a class in some sort of public speaking. I had a class in this, and they were all just kind of more of the same. Do you know what I mean? It was high school, but in a more impressive building. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. And these, they were good classes. They were, they were fine. Just not remarkable. I sit down in this integrated humanities and wonder what this is going to be like. Two men walked in. Now, the year before, I didn't know this at the time, the year before it had been three. Uh, Frank Nellick had, had left the program. Actually, he was trying to draw a fire. It's a long story. I'll tell you later if you want. Uh, uh, two men came in without notes, nothing but Homer's Odyssey. 
and sat down at a table and started to talk. There was no syllabus, not at first. There was no paperwork. There was no, okay, in this class we're going to have a midterm on such and so, we're going to have a final on such and so. They just began to talk. And the first thing they said, I remember, and I repeat to this day to my students, they said, what you need to understand about this class is that it's serious. And I don't mean grim. I mean it matters. Everything we read in this course matters desperately to you and the way you live and the decisions you have to make. Everything. We're not reading anything of merely historical interest. Every, the lecture went on. I walked out of there on cloud. Finally, a class that matters. This, this, now I've got something to look forward to. Instead of just something to get through, I've got something to look forward to. Um, that was my introduction to John Singer. I had never heard of him, I'd never seen him before. He was a tall, uh, thin man. He had a slightly raspy voice. He, he looked, if you looked at him, you'd think, ooh, absent-minded professor. And he was, a little bit. I remember in one class, this, I won't be too graphic, one class in the back, a young, the class had about 40 people in it. It wasn't huge, smaller than this group. Uh, a young lady became ill. She had, threw up all over the floor. He didn't even notice. You know, he was just talking and he, he kept right. He didn't notice until she had gotten up and staggered halfway across the room to leave. And then he, oh, what, what? You know, uh, so he was something of the absent-minded professor. But uh, watch out for those cowboys. You know, just when you think that they're completely abstracted, um, you know, they, they uh, pull out the bullwhip, so to speak. So anyway, um, uh, the, the, the John Senior, the, the author of our book, The Restoration of Christian Culture, um, as I said, uh, uh, is motivated, driven by a love of the world, which itself is driven by a love of its creator, a love of God, which is why he begins the book with, with a little Latin phrase that comes from Richard of St. Victor. Actually, I don't know that it comes, it, our source is Richard of St. Victor. It probably antedates Richard. Um, uh, but but this, this phrase, you may have heard it before, ubi amor ibi oculi, where there is love, there is the eye, is the key, as it were, I hate keys, you know, but, but, but for shorthand, I'll use the phrase, the expression, it's the key to this entire book. Where there is love, there is the eye. Only the lover can actually see the person or the thing beloved. Actually see it which has enormous consequences. It sounds very, perhaps, um, uh, squishily romantic. Uh, from a, a spiritual point of view, it sounds perhaps very lofty and, and um, uh, sort of touching on the, the heels of something vaguely mystical. Um, uh, but it certainly, and in seniors' understanding, it also had a great deal to do with education at all levels. Only the lover can see what a thing is, which means from an educational point of view, the first thing, you mentioned ordered, rightly ordered loves, the first educational imperative is to create a context in which students can fall in love with what there's, not with learning, not with the process, but with the thing they're supposed to know. Okay, once they love, then they can know. And I think, uh, as I, I tell my students all the time, do not take my word for any of this. Consult your own experience. You cannot really understand a thing until it is loved, until it has captured you. We talk about knowledge, and seniors talk about this all the time. We treat knowledge as if it is um, as if it is something that one masters. As if what you know, you have mastered. We even have degrees called master's degrees, right? Uh, we, we treat knowledge as if it is something to dominate, to master, to manipulate, and to control. I have subdued calculus to my apprehension. You know, it took a lot of work, you know, I had to flog it, I shot it a few times with large caliber <laughs> weapons, but but I finally have subdued the calculus. It's exactly, that, that is the late modern approach to knowledge and understanding. The traditional, even pre-Christian 
Western understanding of, of knowledge, especially that order of knowledge that approaches wisdom, but not only that, more about this later perhaps if we have time, uh, but the, the traditional Western approach is, is that we know something when we have been mastered by it. When it has taken possession of us. I'm speaking loosely. I'm not speaking with epistemological precision about these things. If I did, I would have to talk about the process, the rational substances, process of abstraction, of essences, etc., etc., etc. But an essence is abstracted by a knowing subject. The thing becomes subject. The, the person becomes subject to what is known. Okay. So anyway, uh, the, the the point is this: ubi amor ibi alkali though it may sound squishy or vaguely romantic, really is the hard truth about human learning, human education, human relationships, and human spirituality. Yes, certainly that too. But even on the pedestrian level of education, uh, we've got it all wrong. We approach it as a bunch of content to be shoved, um, uh, truths to be mastered and manipulated by a knowing person, knowing mind, the mind that knows them, uh, when in fact, uh, and we wonder why it doesn't seem to work very well, and we wonder why our scores are plummeting, and we wonder why, you know, the generation after accepting everybody in the room, okay, <laughs> this is where I get lynched, yeah. <laughs> Generation after generation seems to get dumber and dumber and dumber. Now the youngest people in the room are reaching for the fruit to hurl. <laughs> uh, that's not you, uh, Zuden. Um, but but this this, uh, this this principle, as I say, underwrites the entire book. And for senior, the ubi amor ibi alkali, where there is love, there is the eye. It's not just a cool, interesting feature of human intelligence. The love itself is a kind of. It's it's not. A it's not called love because that's the proper category to which it belongs. It is, he calls it in the Restoration, he calls it chivalric, flaming, tempestuous. Um, uh, he opens the book with frequent reference to the Song of Solomon. You know, that one book in the Old Testament that, that um, uh, everyone likes to avoid and those who don't like to avoid it like to read it when no one's around. You know, uh, that's the that's the kind of love. It is it is passionate. It is intense. It is focused with laser-like intensity. So, what's the deal with love? Is, why is love so important? Because, as as he says very early on in the first chapter of the Restoration, we do not get to heaven merely, as we've been told, we do not attain to heaven merely by obeying the commandments. We don't even attain to heaven by loving our neighbor merely. We attain to heaven by loving as Christ has loved us. That's more than just patiently putting up with this smelly old neighbor over here. There's a, this, in that little book, there's a poem called, um, Oh, it's a, I think it's something like Church on Sunday, and, and the poem is in, from the point of view of this rather angry man attending uh, some sort of church service of a Sunday, and he says, love thy neighbor, Christ, not this neighbor, not this particular smelly neighbor, smelling of money and poodles. Uh, uh, somebody, get, you mean neighborly average, you mean neighbor in the abstract, get me a theologian. <laughs> That, that wasn't written by Senior, but Senior hardly approved of that, but he d directed our attention precisely to that poem. Uh, the love that Christ has for us is itself, it's joyful, it is passionate, and in every sense the word passion, it, right? It is a love that Senior describes as it, uh, joyful, entailing suffering and sacrifice. No one gets to heaven unless they love joyfully in suffering and with sacrifice. That's it. That's the book, so to speak. Uh, and so the whole book, then, is an unfolding of this principle of love. So Christian culture, you might say, is a kind of circularity of love. Now, he doesn't use this. I use this to make it to make my own presentation sound more respectable and academic. Um, uh, but, but that is, culture, he says, exists in order to shroud, protect, to put a roof over and a floor beneath 
the Mass. The Mass is at the center of Christian culture, not just metaphorically at the center. Culture grows up in order to house the Mass, which means you need literally housing, but you also need priests, and priests need mothers and fathers, and they need to be fed, you know, and they need to be clothed, and mothers and fathers need to be fed and clothed, and siblings have to keep priests humble, because otherwise they, they go nuts, you know. And so, boom, 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 boom. It turns out, you know, culture radiates outward from the Eucharist, from the Mass. And, to, to protect it, and, 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 and in turn, uh, culture so, so, so culture inclines toward the mass, and the mass, as it were, inclines or blossoms forth into culture. Uh, if you want to put it this way, you could say that culture exists in order to surround and protect the mass, which is the sacred heart of Christianity. But, but also, Senior says that the mass and the life of prayer it generates gives birth to culture. So culture protects the mass, and the mass gives birth to culture. There's this circularity. Now, now, with respect, a great deal of the restoration concerns education. And there, Senior says over and over and over again something we desperately wish were not true. We hope it's not true. We pray it's not true. We fear it's true. And that is that, that um, in explication of another medieval phrase, famous phrase, there is nothing in the intellect that is not first in the senses. Again, there's a sort of dry, epistemological, philosophical explication of that. Seniors is anything but dry and philosophical. But he, he, he points out that the meaning of that sentence, in concrete, practical terms, is that we learn, we educate our intellects, not first by addressing the intellect or the intelligence. We educate the intellect by first addressing the body. Think of children. Think of the very little children. Uh, in the Greek uh, tradition, this was known as gymnastic. And no, I don't mean jumping jacks. I mean the training of the body. The body had to be adequated to the world because the body and its uses, its, its functions, its operations in the world shaped what, what we now call the imagination. And the imagination itself is the soil out of which, as it were, rationality or reason grows. So, so in other words, there's a threefold process. There is, there is the shaping, the training, the, the education of the body in gymnastic, the education of the imagination through um, music and poetry and story and song, and it, again, if you just think of children and, and growing up, you know, they, they begin by, you, you take a baby and you dangle it on your knee and you go, boom, you know, ride a cock horse to Bamberg Cross, or you know, this is the way the gentleman trots, gentleman trots, gentleman trots, you know, you do that with babies, and they roll it, and, 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 and you know, that's, that's what they do. If you said, now, my child, when you can read Descartes, then, you know, we're going to have a conversation, you know, get back to me then. Uh, something's wrong, something's disordered. And I'm, I'm being, you know, absurd in my examples, but you get the point. You begin with the body, you know, you, you, their intelligence. I, I love, this is a senior-esque kind of comment, but it, it's through my own experience. Um, gosh, I hope I don't embarrass anyone. Uh, those moments, have you bumped into people in the grocery store who are crouching down, reasoning, with a three-year-old about the Tootsie Rock or something. And, they're trying, and you see, that, there's this thing called private property. And, and people own things because they have a right to their own bodies, and that body depends on certain material things outside of the body that they also have a right to by extension. It's called an entailment. And because of that entailment, you see, that belongs in, you can, so you actually have to obtain some sort of labor and blah, 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 and, 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 and the three-year-old, you, you can tell what they're thinking, because you're thinking it too, you know. You're thinking, you're reasoning with a child that is 98% will, 2% appetite. <laughs> there's no reason that, but there's a reason the church talks about an age of reason. Uh, uh, so so uh, you, you start with the body and then you move to the imagination, because after you dandle them on your knee and you've said, you know, this is the way the gentleman trots, the gentleman trots, the gentleman trots, then what you, well, you've actually snuck 
poetry in to begin having you right there. Even though you're bouncing them up and down on your knee, they're getting the idea of rhythm, verbal rhythm. And, and you, then, you then move on to Mother Goose. And, and um, um, uh, uh, all the nursery rhymes. And then you move on to the stories, the, the great childhood stories, the, you know, everything from Aesop's fables to Grimm's fairy tales to Anderson. And it doesn't, and if you remember your experience, it often doesn't matter if the child is too young to even understand the story. Uh, now, you don't want to read them Faulkner or crying, you know, <laughs> just, just quit, just stop. Uh, but, but, but have you noticed you might be reading a Grimm's fairy tale? to your five and six year old, but your three year old, who's not really clued in, is nevertheless sitting there wrapped. The, uh, the imagination is being shaped, is being formed. And it is later then that the intellect is addressed, usually through memory, the early stages of education. I'm not gonna go through all of this uh, in any detail, but my point is, Senior's point is that uh, as a culture, we have lost sight of human nature and therefore we've lost sight uh, uh, of its education. How do you educate that nature? And you begin again with the body, which is why even at the grade school level, well, by the way, these things are not entirely left behind. You, know, you don't graduate out of the body. Okay, you can address my mind now, my body is in a bit more sleeping. Uh, we, 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 we don't actually leave any of these stages behind. They develop, you know, they, they, they're transformed, but they're not abandoned, even the education of the body, right? Uh, um, I, I could go into examples, but this, I, I realize I'm, I'm already running on a bit long, perhaps. So, so um, uh, the, the, the schoolboy or schoolgirl of first, second, third grade, a great deal of their activity really ought to be physical. I'm, I, I'm um, moved to something approaching a kind of despair. Every time I see these really well-intentioned, hard-driving, wonderfully um, uh, traditional and civilized uh, uh, parents and schoolmasters and teachers um, boasting of the fact that they got their second graders to read Thucydides in the Greek. <laughs> it's, it's a fallacy. The faster and the sooner you're doing something, the smarter you and your kids must be. I mean, think about the logic of that. The faster and sooner you do something, the better you must be at it. What, what part, what facet, what, what, what uh, wing of human life is actually like that? Almost nothing. Cooking? <laughs> you know, car, anything? Filling out insurance policy paperwork? I mean, not, almost none of life or actually works that way. But it's a fallacy that we are devoted to. We, 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 we clutch it to our, our, our breasts. You know, we oh, I just love speed and efficiency. Um, uh, it, it is a mistake, and I'm afraid people who have every good intention think they're, they're educating their children far better when they're doing something that usually older kids do. Now, there's a good reason they do that, because we've all learned that older kids are actually learning nothing. Uh, it's an understandable mistake. You know, by, we're going to make sure they learn things, and they're going to be speaking Greek by the third grade. Um, uh, you really need to wait till the fourth grade before they're speaking Greek. But, um, anyway, you, you get the point. So, so the, the gymnastic and what he calls poetry and music, which is not just poetry and it's not just music, it's a capital P, capital N, anything that addresses the imagination, anything that flames the moral sensibility, because the, the moral sensibilities um, um, are, are, are shaped primarily in the imagination. Do you remember, okay, academic parenthesis, uh, those of you who have studied Aristotle's ethics might remember very early on, he talks about how important it is to have, uh, for ethical reasoning, reasoning about ethics, how important it is that someone uh, uh, has had a good upbringing. Do, do, do you remember that? This is where I tell my students, just nod your head. Just do this. Whether you've read it or not, just mm. um, uh, Do you remember that? Well, that's what Aristotle's talking about. If you have, if your imagination has been shaped, if it has been sort of inflamed by the tales of, of George Washington's heroism, you know, and, and the, the sacrifice and, or the courage of Cincinnatus, you know, Cincinnatus, 
Um, if, if, the, if the imagination has been inflamed by the passions and the, 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 the heroic deeds of this and that and the next thing, then when you come to reason about courage, when you come to actually do the philosophy of ethical reasoning, you can do it. But if someone was never inflamed, if, if their imaginations were never animated, uh, driven to, uh, to wonder at the, the kind of noble self-sacrifice of this dog, you know, that, that, that attacked the bear and let the child run away home safe while the dog died fighting this unequal battle, you know. If, if, if the kid has never had that kind of excitement, not only will the kid not know courage when he or she encounters it, but the kid will not even be able to think about courage clearly, okay? So this is Senior's point about the education of the senses, the education of the imagination, which is then followed by the education of the intellect or the reason. So uh, because, because this is human nature, he then suggests prescriptively that we need to do something in order to cultivate that nature, in order to Christianize it, in order to Christianize our culture or restore a, uh, a, a culture that is Christian, it is Catholic. And that is, he says at several points, to our shock and horror, smash the TV. He actually uses that verb, smash the TV. We would say, shoot the uh, computer screen. Um, there is a very strong, what in, is usually derisively described as Luddite strain in John Singer's thinking. And I would like to talk about that a little bit. Maybe it'll come up in the Q&A. But fundamentally, Senior understood that the education of both the senses and the imagination was, every pun is intended, short-circuited by the radical passivity of modern media. That there are two things that have happened with the advent of technologized life. And by technology, I just don't mean electronics. I, I mean pretty much anything post-industrial revolution. Two things have happened. We have insulated and isolated ourselves from the order of nature Right? We have exercised a command over the order of nature in such a way as our senses are no longer habituated to the natural properties of creation. Okay, just now from a Catholic point of view, that's in itself a problematic idea. Right? If creation is made by God, if we are made by God, if our senses are to be adequated uh, if the book of the world, remember Contemptus Mundi, if the book of the world is to be read, you have to actually be in the book of the world. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be critical of my hosts, but look around you right now. The air we're breathing is temperature control. The light that we have is mediated. Right? This isn't sunlight we're dealing with. This isn't natural light. We, we are dressed we move and live and have our beings in a man-made, not natural, environment. Now, you might think, was Senior some kind of a hippie? Um, well, no. But he was a Catholic who understood that God made the world and man's sensibilities proportionate to each other. And the degree to which we remain ignorant of the natural rhythms and life and expression of the created order, the more we live in a mediated order of our own making, the less our sensibilities, as it were, are prepared for actual reasoning. So he goes on to say that the experiment, that the great books programs that we have in the world have actually failed. They have largely failed. And not because of any bad intent, but rather because the students' sensibilities and their imagination. First of all, the students have not been raised up. Uh, uh, in, in, uh, their imaginations have not been shaped by the things that have traditionally shaped the imagination of the West. They have been shaped by Sesame Street or some, you know, excrescence like that. Um, I hope I haven't offended it. You know, any real diehard Sesame Street fans. <laughs> Uh, that, that is, our imaginations are pretty tepid, and are our sensibilities, 
and our understanding of natural phenomena. He tells the story in, this, in, in the restoration of, of, of trying to teach Chaucer a great book, a great author. Right? Trying to cheat, uh, uh, the, second, the nun's priest tale concerns Chanticleer, who is a rooster who engages in Thomistic scholastic disputation with his wife, Dame Pertolota. Okay, now, that's funny. That's your cue to that's funny. Um, But it's even funnier if you know how roosters behave. And the problem is you can only half teach that thing because nobody in the classroom has spent any time around. I've actually been in a class, right? this is true, I've been in a class where the behavior, and I'm not Mr. Natural, you know, I, you don't see me in camos, do you? <laughs> but, but where the behavior of deer is actually important to the story. And, and one kid out of a class of 30, oh, you know, because he'd spent enough time with a rifle in his hands out you know, hunting, he actually got what the story, what, or what that element of the story was about. And everyone knows he's, it's an abstraction, uh, unmoved. So Senior, isn't, senior is talking about that, but not just about this or that quaint episode, which requires you to understand how beans grow. Uh, what he's talking about is a pervasive in culture, what have we been enculturated into? And it isn't the created order. And therefore, our sensibilities have not been proportioned, as it were, have not been shaped in a proportionate way, experienced in a proportionate way um, to the book of the world. And therefore, when you and I start thinking about the world, we're lousy at it. We're just terrible at it. And we don't know it the way lovers know anything. Because you can't. There's a paradox in this, right? Not only can you not, not know something until you love it, you have to know something of a thing before you can love it. And we know next to nothing of creation on the sensory level. For us, it's all, they're all headshots. It's all abstraction. But nothing is in the intellect, which is not first in the senses. So yes, it is, you know, you can consider it hippie if you wish, but, but there is something about our experience of the natural world proportioning our sensibilities and rendering them susceptible then, or rendering our reasoning susceptible to the kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's a plant organic metaphor, right? The imagination is the soil out of which the reason grows. And if that soil is depleted, you're not going to get much in the way of reasoning. Um, I see I really am going long. Uh, let me... Let me say something else about education and then I'll, I'll wrap up pretty quickly. Uh, and I do, as I say, I, I'm probably going to be more helpful to you in answering questions than in rambling. In an important section of this book, Dr. Senior talks about uh, the rule of St. Benedict. And again, a superficial or cursory review of the book might think that it is simply a hobby horse. He's got some particular fascination with things Benedictine. Um, what, what could this have to do with civilization at large or education in particular? And Dr. Senior's answer would be a very short one word, everything. He says that the virtues articulated in the opening words of the prologue of the rule contain all the seeds in principle, all the seeds for effective Christian education and indeed Christian culture. In Senior's translation, that's hear, my son, the precepts of the teacher, and incline the ears of thy heart to accept the admonitions of loving Father freely and fulfill them. We begin by listening. Hear, my son, the precepts of the teacher. Listening. Senior discusses that listening is not simply the passive, the, the, the passive posture of auditory receptivity, but rather one only listens in the condition of silence. And the silence is not merely external, but it's interior as well. An interior silence is achieved when the right order of reason, will, appetite, and passion obtains. And it, most of us are still, I'll speak for myself, I am still very much working on that right ordering, which means I am not very capable of listening terribly well. 
even now, right? That, that is, to have a condition of interior silence so that one can hear, one needs to have his reason in command of his passions and will and appetites. Unruly things, they. And then the one is to listen. This silence is to be penetrated by the admonitions of the teacher, which means a, a, a posture not only of silence, but of docility. Docility actually means just teachable, but docility we understand to mean a kind of willingness, a kind of desire or hunger uh, um, uh, for what is to be learned. And thus, Senior argues, a friendship, this entails or implies a kind of friendship between the teacher and the student. Not a friendship predicated on equality, not that kind of Aristotelian friendship, but a friendship that is analogous to the friendship between God and man. Very much not one of equality, right? But nevertheless, one actuated by a kind of love for each other, as well as a love for the things being learned. Okay, God loves his creation too, right? Uh, to love the things that God loves is a step toward deepening the spiritual life. Well, um, um, this, this docility, this listening and receptivity to, to uh, in friendship to the teachings, the admonitions of the teacher, then results in that, that famous Benedictine conversion. Conversion of heart, conversion of what they call conversion of manners. And the senior goes on in depth about what does it mean or what does the conversion of manners mean? And I, I don't have time to go into it here. You all think that's a dodge, I know, but just ask them about it in Q and A, and then we can spend some time on it. You're, you're my excuse. Um, but 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 suffice it to say that conversion of manners is actually the seabed of Christian or Catholic civilization and culture. That what happens when you have a vibrant contemplative culture, and by that I mean not that everybody's a monk. I mean that everybody has a life of prayer, or at least that a, life, a, a prayer life is presumptive of everyone. Even those who don't live up to it live in an order where they know it's presumptive. Right? They know they're not living up to something. Uh, so a life of prayer is presumptive and a significant um, uh, order or segment of the culture is actually dedicated to a life of contemplation. In that context, civilization has a conversion of manners and there is a general kind of elevation. Not manners as in drinking tea with one's pinky finger extended, but manners where um, the, the, the hard boundaries of charity are not where we begin, but we begin with the very wide and generous boundaries of good manners. So manners are, think of manners as a kind of perimeter defense of the virtues. Right? The manners themselves aren't virtues. Manners are not morals. Okay? But they're an extended defensive perimeter around morals, right? You don't want to rely. I mean, it's, 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 it's one of the mercies of God. We don't, we don't properly rely on our charity. We don't want to have to rely on it. We're pretty weak and bad and stupid. So we don't want to have to depend, lean heavily on our actual virtue all the time. We need to lean as often as possible on our habits of good manners. Right? So you don't cut off the person in traffic, okay? Not because you are consciously and deliberately, as it were, in charity declining to do this thing, but because it never occurred to you to do this thing, okay? But we can talk more about that later if you wish. But the conversion of manners as well as the conversion of heart is what results from this, this educational posture of hear my son, the precepts, that is, listening. So good teachers then, we know, ignite the hearts and the imaginations and then the intellects of their students. I'm often asked, I don't know if Zach asked me this, but I'm often asked, what, I'm going to be a teacher, I would like to be a teacher, what, what's the most important thing? Do you have any advice for me, Dr. Wade? And I said, yes, my first piece of advice is ask advice of people who know something worth giving. Um, uh, in other words, go to somebody wise for advice, not me. But but it is, it, it is the case, uh, I will go on to tell them that your primary, especially grade school and high school, your primary responsibility is to make the students make, you understand, make the students fall in love 
the subject. Also, to fall in love with a conversion of manners, that is, of being civilized people. Fall in love with, with their department. And this all sounds so snotty, doesn't it? Um, uh, one minute, I sound like I'm, you know, dressed in camos, and the next I sound as if, you know, we should all be waltzing our way to the parking lot. Um, tough. It's just, you're going to have to wrap your mind around it. Uh, it's, it's in the book. So, so um, uh, this, this is what you, would you do as a teacher. It sounds sentimental. It sounds squishy. Um, it sounds vaguely reminiscent of every dodge of moral responsibility that we have been disgusted with and abused by for the past 60, 70 years in, in edu lower and higher education. Oh, we're just interested in loving the subject. You know, be, uh, Frank Nellick used to say, if you meet the guru on the road, kill him. You know, <laughs> if you meet somebody saying, love, education is all about love, cripple them. <laughs> Maybe not kill them, but certainly remove their legs. Um, uh, the, I, I hope you understand the distinction. The first responsibility is to address the, 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 uh, the, the heart of the student so that you can get to the mind. You don't address the heart in order to avoid the mind. That's the distinction. Okay. Nor do you address the heart in order to win popularity contests because it's not about you. It's about chemistry. And if you don't fall in love with chemistry, something's wrong with you. And yes, I know. Very often, something is wrong with you. you know, something's certainly wrong with me. But but you get the point. Right? You've got this. This thing is magnificent. God loves this thing. So should we. Um, so he concludes by, by, uh, by reminding everyone that the ultimate, uh, the ultimate purpose of all education is that uh, famous model of the Jesuit order uh, uh, for the greater glory of God. He begins the, the book and ends it with a reference to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And, uh, this book actually is a song, a kind of song in praise of the Blessed Virgin. Um, uh, I can talk later perhaps about why that is. Uh, Dr. Senior's devotion to the Blessed Virgin, he died praying the rosary. He died in the middle of an ave. Um, uh, literally died. Uh, his wife was kneeling next to the bed he was lying in, and uh, he passed away in the middle of a Hail Mary. This, by his own standard, is the happiest of deaths. Uh, the Blessed Virgin, uh, Dr. Senior taught us all to, uh, to chant, even in our miserable vocal way, to chant the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary every day, every weekday, uh, in the academic year at the local Catholic church. And we incompetent, warbling, besotted souls would line up to 30 or 40 strong and, and for that 20 minutes every afternoon at 4 p.m., the church actually became a little bit of heaven. That, in my own recollection, that 20 minute period every day, four o'clock in my undergraduate years, with young and old, chant, mostly young, but chanting in Latin our you know, very bad Gregorian chant, that still counts as the happiest moments of my life. And I'm no esthete, and I'm no mystic, I'm as miserable as anybody, but that was obvious even to me. It was a corner of heaven. We were with God, doing what we will do in heaven, if we're blessed enough to get there. So that's Dr. Senior's gift to, to me. Dr. Senior's gift to his students, Dr. Senior's gift to the world, was this due appreciation for the Blessed Virgin's role in bringing people to her son, and therefore bringing people to their eternal beatitude. And on that note, I think I'll wrap it up and ask for questions. <coughs> I see that this was recorded. I will disavow everything I said. <laughs> yes, sir. I don't always remember where I 
read things. I kind of suspect that I read this in, in John Sr. But it wasn't only that our family and our economy comes out of the mass, but it was the, what we usually think of as culture. The drama got kicked out of the mass and became the passion plays, which became uh, literally true. true. Right. And um, music started with chant and got to Bach and then went downhill from there. Um, and, and painting and you know so on. It, it all came. It, it radiated out from the mass. Is, is, is that in senior? Or did, I, did I read that somewhere? In, else? in the first part of what you said is literally in senior. The second part of what you said is implicit in in everything, uh, and it may be in something else other than this book. But but yes, the the, the remark was: um, Is it true that not just um, culture in the broadest sense, but even culture in the particular artistic sense? Uh, is the product of the mass. Uh, uh, drama, modern drama, actually originates not in our continuation of Greek and Roman uh, the theater, but rather uh, the, the theater that, that came out of the mass, out of the liturgies of the Middle Ages, when those liturgies and those, you know the dramatic um, uh, reading of the gospel on Palm Sunday? Okay, well there were liturgies in the Middle Ages where that got a little more became more robust, more performative, and at a certain point, the performance was clearly moving out of a liturgical context and into a performance context, and so it was, as you, I think you said, kicked out. You know, it was, well, let's do that on the steps of the church rather than in the church, and and then you had the um, the development of early uh, medieval drama. Uh, out of which modern drama comes, and then later the classics were sort of rediscovered. So, so yes, it's true. Art, painting, music, uh, the church. The, Pope Benedict likes to make this point, right? That that the church is the benevolent and uh, enthusiastic parent or grandparent of almost all the arts, and is just as the, 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 the Pope John, uh, Saint John Paul II, the, the the university, the colleges are themselves. Uh, the, they come out of the heart of the church. So the church is, is really the, the, um, um, uh, the, the I, sh I guess I should say the mother. The church really is the mother, gives birth to all of these magnificent cultural expressions. I, I think Dr. Senior would uh, uh, not, I know he says the, the, the first part, uh, um, uh, but he, he would avow all of this with a caveat. And the caveat would be this. The value of the church lies not in the fact that these cultural byproducts are produced. The value of the church is in its being the mystical body of Christ. Those byproducts are testimony to its being the mystical body, not the mystical body exists in order to produce byproducts. Does that make sense? So, so you know, the, we have, uh, our, uh, many, by we, I don't mean you and I, I mean our world has a very secular sort of default setting in the imagination. So we think, oh, I'm going to approve of the church because it, it, it ultimately, it gave us Shakespeare. And you say, well, well no, it, it, it didn't really give you Shakespeare that way. What happened is uh, it gave you Shakespeare because, A, Shakespeare had human nature that was edified and informed by the richness of the mystical body of Christ. That's what that is. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but, but yes, that was out of Dr. Seymour's survey. Other questions? I was, I was told that you were full of questions. I, I mean, I'm not going to let you go until you ask a lot of questions. Yes, sir? Regarding technology, I understand that the monastic orders were responsible for a lot of early technological innovations uh, in farming and so on. How, where does that stop? Where do we go from uh, the Benedictines de developing the water wheel to the iPod or the iPad? Where, how, where does the break? That, that, that's, that's an excellent question. Dr. Senior used to say that theologians and philosophers argue vigorously that very question. Um, at, at, at what point have we gone from, shall we say, is something no longer a tool, and has it, has it become a machine? That's one interesting question. Uh, another interesting question related would be, at what point is a machine or a tool helpful? How can we tell the difference between something being helpful and something being harmful? Uh, especially because it's helpful for X, but harmful for Y. 
and how do we tell how do we measure these things that, that is the help against the harm so um, uh, he didn't he did not have he didn't present an answer he didn't say that he had all this figured out he put it more in, in, in more uh, general and sweeping terms and it would be this and I'll, I'll get to you in just a second um, the for almost all of human history ordinary life was lived according to recognizable patterns closely related to the natural uh, uh, operations of the created world. Um, in about a hundred years, that changed dramatically. So, so most people lived in rural environments doing rural things. And by rural, I don't mean necessarily agriculture. Right? It could be craft, it could be you know, what have you. Um, but most people spent most of their times in rural environments doing productive things of one sort or another that involved um, uh, manus, the hand, manual labor, okay, that involved craft of one sort or another from, uh, you know, daily life from 1000 BC to 1700, 1750 pretty recognizably the same. Despite all those great historical changes and difference, daily life for most people, sheep behaved the same way, cattle behaved the same way, fences behaved the same way. Uh, it was a big deal in the Middle Ages when somebody invented the stirrup. That was a big deal. <laughs> so, so, um, um, but from 1750, well, let's put it this way. Um, in 1820, no, I'm sorry. In 1801, the vast majority of people in England lived in the countryside. By 1850, two-thirds lived in the cities. So in 49 years, what had never before happened in human history had happened, and that is the urbanization and um, kind of mechanization of human society. Light. Think of the 19th century. Essentially, the 19th century, more even than the 20th and the 21st century, was the century where ordinary human life for ordinary people was lived in a way that would not have been recognized by their parents, grandparents, forebears. So he would point to that. He would say, in, in, in a hundred years, the entire way ordinary life was lived was transformed. I can't tell you exactly where or when or what. I, I, it's beyond me. But I can look at the macro picture and say, you know what? We no longer are living in uh, uh, with the same experience of the created order. We're, we're, we're just not. And you know, I'm very grateful for that. Every time I have a toothache or need penicillin, right? Um, my wife would be dead now if it weren't for the surgeries that, that modern medicine, and, and Dr. Senior didn't hide from any of that. All of that's true. We're thankful and grateful for all of those things, and in many contexts, those things are themselves blessings and graces. But we, we, being grateful for them does not um, uh, allow us, or does not force us, as it were, to forfeit the right to look at the macro picture and say, our sensibilities are not being shaped by the created order as they once were, and our ability to reason about such things has been impacted, don't like that verb, uh, uh, adversely. Yes, sir? I, I, the thought occurred to me as the question was being in, uh, asked that the rule of St. Benedict itself points to the idea that the whole of the life of the Benedictine monk, and indeed the whole community, was enshrined in this sense of cooperation with creation. Everything that the Benedictine did in their, their study, their work, their prayer, their recreation, was built into this idea of cooperating with creation and nature around them. And in the rule, it actually talks about treating every tool that you use in your relationship with nature as if it were one of the sacred vessels of the altar. <laughs> Very good. So Very good. That, and, and if you carry that forward, at some point, how how can you possibly treat an iPhone like a sacred vessel on the altar? I think a lot of people worship their iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good point. Very good point. Um, I, I will say this: there's a kind of divine practical joke on us. 
in point of fact, I mean, a, a philosopher or maybe a theologian would say, in point of fact, um, we do every technological innovation, every invention, be it material, mechanical, electronic, chemical, whatever, everything we have discovered, every manipulation of nature, nature that we've manufactured or managed, is in principle and in fact a cooperation with nature. We have, until we can create ex nihilo, we're doomed to cooperate. That's all we get to do. But, it doesn't feel like it, does it? It's not experienced on our part. Subjectively, it's not experienced as cooperation. It is experienced as mastery. Right? And we talk about it. Bert, Bert, he quotes Bertrand Russell, who says, the purpose of science is to make nature sit up and beg. Right? Um, that's the purpose of science. And, and this goes back to Bacon in the, in the early modern period. You know, what, what we have to do is uh, 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 manipulate nature so that we can exercise control over it. So to subjectively, even though technically we're cooperating, and that's God's uh, practical joke on us. You know, we think we're mastering, but we're still just playing by his creation, as it were. Uh, we're still cooperating, but we are harming ourselves uh, in that we are experiencing it as a kind of false autonomy, a false mastery, a false subjection of nature to our will. We're becoming spoiled. Uh, we, we expect nature just to do what we want. And how many, how many of you, I mean, this is a stupid example, but, but no, this is a rhetorical question, don't answer. How many of you have been in a traffic accident, have been in a car accident? The first sensation everybody has, if they are conscious and not um, physically damaged, harmed, the first sensation everyone has is surprise. They didn't really feel like they were going 40 miles an hour. The, the, the sensation of the crash is, is Oh, oh, oh I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't actually have any sense of my momentum until it suddenly stopped. I didn't really have any sense of this being a machine that I was in. I kind of felt like I was in an easy chair in my living room watching TV, and it turns out that I was actually in a metal box hurling down the street at, at, at even 25 miles an hour. It feels awfully fast when you suddenly come to a halt. So, so you know, we don't experience our mastery, or excuse me, our interaction with with uh, technology as actually still subjected to nature. We experience it as mastery, and when that mastery is ripped away from us all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's um, arresting, it's arresting. There was a sign of one... One more. One more? One more? Yeah. Are you, I'm, I'm happy to go on and on and on and bore you to death, but the problem is I'm standing in between you and more wine, so that <laughs> puts my own life in, in peril. So, uh, one more question. Yes, ma'am. In fact, if you go out in the garage, you can tell the division of labor is still still exists. All of my tools are designed to kill things, and all of her tools are designed to grow them. It's really true, you know. Uh, all of hers are designed to grow, and mine are to destroy. <laughs> so I have the whackers and the smackers and the you know, gasoline, and, and, and she's got you know the rototiller and, the, and, the, and the, the, all the little frames for tomatoes. So, so uh, we tried to raise chickens, and uh, finally we gave up, realizing we were not raising chickens uh, for eggs. We were raising raccoon food. <laughs> let's, not, let's not sentimentalize nature. My three-year-old Robert 
wept for, for half a day when he and Janet, my wife, went out to the chicken coop to feed the little chicks. They had bought 20 brand new little chicks. They went out there and there were 20 headless chick bottles. I mean, it had not even had a three-course meal. It had just killed everyone, biting off their heads. And there are little pools of blood. I mean, it was pretty gross. And this three-year-old is traumatized. So let's not be sentimental about the rhythms of nature. The rhythms of nature can be, you know. You killing tools. Uh, <laughs> no, wait a minute. <laughs> I will boast about that. It's true. Four years ago, the raccoon, one of the raccoons, was actually in a fight with another one, way up in a tree. So I don't have night vision equipment, and I don't have infrared rifles, oh golly. I had a 22 and a flashlight, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, I nailed that sucker 25 <laughs> I'm not proud. I'm, you know, I write books, and I, I write things. I'm, I'm kind of proud of my scholarship. You know, I'm an okay teacher. I haven't been fired yet. Um, I'm, I'm all right with most things. I'm really proud of you. I'll boast in public about that. Okay, but let me come back to your question, which is a very serious one. Principal Dr. Senior used to repeat over and over, run, walk, do not run, walk, out of the 20th century. We would say 21st. Do not attempt dramatic, radical, heroic, impossible, ludicrous, transparently ridiculous extremes to reintegrate oneself with the natural order or the natural rhythms, uh, uh, operations of a created order. Do what is within one's reach, reasonably, without going nuts and becoming kind of quick, you know, some sort of Catholic homage, right? Um, so, so. I say that because a friend of mine actually did that and wrote a book about it called Switched Off, Eric Brendy. It's a really quite, quite a good book. I highly recommend it. But what, what, what Dr. Senior says in, in this book, you remember, he's just turn off the television, read aloud, sing, recreate, eat together. I mean, if a modern family ate together regularly, read of an evening together, and, and it's all ages, I mean, I, last night, I, I, not a paragon of virtue, but I was reading um, um, Winnie the Pooh to my four-year-old. I enjoy it. Winnie the Pooh is really good stuff. You know, not the Disney version. You know, the real, uh, it, it's really good stuff. Um, and Beatrix Potter is fantastic. And then, of course, Grimm is fantastic. And uh, these are, these, these are the, we didn't even get into the good books, great books distinction, which, which is a whole, a whole other conversation. But, but the, these activities can include the whole or almost all of the family. Okay? If one were to do that regularly of an evening, and that alone, that would, that would revolutionize the world. I mean, think about it. Uh, Dr. Senior says, if, if you can do just those things, smash the, or, or turn off the television, walk away from the computer, read aloud, sing, play, dine together. If you do nothing but that, maybe have a garden. Yes, I, yes, have a chicken or two if you can, but you don't have to. Don't have a go. Um, hey, uh, what you say? Oh, I'm glad my wife doesn't know you. <laughs> She's arguing for a goat. So anyway, um, no, no I got a but, but, <laughs> I still have the 22. <laughs> I don't even know the man, and I'm threatening his goat. <laughs> this car has officially gone off the rails. <laughs> so seriously, if, if one is to do just those things, just those, and you do it with neighbors, what if you know three or four families that live kind of like that? And what if you're friends? And what if you even live in some proximity? What if on the same block? He actually does this in the book. He says, you know, someone's going to open up a little shop. And someone's going to open up a little bar where the men go to drink because they're happy and not to get happy. Which is the difference between drink and drunkenness. Okay? And, and a tea shop where the women will go to converse and talk and share the news of the day. In other words, do you see what he's doing? He's talking about suddenly 
that alone would start producing, start radiating a kind of mini culture that if it becomes, when it becomes normative, is the culture. So I, I think we don't even have to be that dramatic and aspirational. All we have to say is an ordinary family living like that, which is doable, it's very doable, is radically different from almost all contemporary Western families, and radically better. I, you know, you don't want to be snotty about it, but it's it's really true. Just that you don't have to grow your own wheat. I mean, good if you do. Although, again, reason means. I'll say this and shut up. I know you're all itching to go. Prudence means that you you recognize how the principle is applied to the practice of your particulars, your circumstances. For some people, that can actually mean growing almost all their own food, raising their own animals, making money at the, on the farmer's market on weekends, and, and uh, living as gentlemen farmers, or full-time farmers, or just people with a nice garden, half of which is flowers anyway. It depends on the circumstances and the abilities. If I were to do this because I have no talent, I, I'm better at, at um, craft, that is working with wooden things, than I am with plants. So, you know, let someone do the plants, let someone else fix the rototiller or whatever. Do, do, do you see what I mean? You, you apply the principle of integrate yourself as much as one can reasonably with the operations of the created order. Um, and that's going to differ from person to person. And unfortunately, the Catholics love rule books. We love, spell it out, give it to me, this is what I do, and then I'm okay. That's not rules. You adapt it to your circumstances with the principle in mind and the realities of your situation in mind at the same time. Thank you. I, I why don't we, you have a follow up? I just think that's really funny that you said that. I'm a Catholic Amish because I've been telling everybody that I'm going to become Catholic Amish. Catholic Amish. And I was just hilarious. That, well, that was probably Providence then. Yeah. You know, that's a Catholic Amish. Very good. Well, thank you all. Now, I, let's talk afterwards. Yes.